despite some of the news in the church that has broken this week, especially that nonsense coming out of Germany, I'm going to take a brief break from that for my own mental health before jumping into all of that on Monday, and instead provide you today with something I've been trying to get done for two weeks now. I have two short prophecies for what appears to be our time made by two of the greatest modern saints of the church, St. John Bosco and St. Louis de Montfort. Both of their visions have clear implications for our time and for the modern crisis in the church, but, most importantly, they show us how this will all end. In short, we have a hint today of what the triumph of the Immaculate Heart may actually look like. Now, of course, this isn't going to be painted in the clearest picture of all, so, you know, that's just the nature of prophecy. But let's get into this. The first of these two warnings comes from St. John Bosco, who had his prophetic and highly symbolic vision in the spring of 1862, 100 years almost exactly to the day before the start of the Second Vatican Council, and I do not think that that is a coincidence. His vision has been widely accepted among the traditional clergy of being about our time, and the ills of our time, both in the church and, frankly, in the world, caused by the council, at least in part. I'll let you decide for yourself about that, but the year of his vision is interesting, to say the least. After this vision, I will have another prophecy for our times, about how this wicked age will end, and it is a message of hope. But first, the vision of St. John Bosco, approved by the church. Imagine yourself be with me on the seashore, or better, on an isolated rock, and not to see any patch of land other than that under your feet. On the whole of that vast sheet of water you see an innumerable fleet of ships in battle array. The prows of the ships are formed into sharp spear-like points, so that wherever they are thrust they pierce and completely destroy. These ships are armed with cannons, with lots of rifles, with incendiary materials, with other firearms of all kinds, and also with books and advance against a ship very much bigger and higher than themselves, and try to dash it against it with a prow, or burn it in some way to do it every possible harm. An escort to that majestic fully equipped ship, there are many smaller ships, which receive commands by signal from it and carry out movements to defend themselves from the opposing fleet. In the midst of the immense expanse of sea, two mighty columns of great height arise a little distance the one from the other, on the top of one, there is the statue of the Immaculate Virgin, from whose feet hangs a large placard with this inscription, Auxilium Christianorum, Help of Christians. On the other, which is much higher and bigger, stands a host of great size proportionate to the column, and beneath it another placard with the words, Salus Corentium, Salvation of the Faithful. The supreme commander of the big ship is the sovereign pontiff. He, seeing the fury of the enemies and the evils among which his faithful find themselves, determines to summon around himself the captains of the smaller ships to hold a council and decide what is to be done. All the captains come aboard and gather around the Pope. They hold a meeting, but meantime the wind and the waves gather in storm, so they are sent back to control their own ships. There comes a short lull. For a second time the Pope gathers the captains around him, while the flagship goes on its course. But the frightful storm returns. The Pope stands at the helm, and all his energies are being directed to steering the ship towards those two columns, from whose summit hang many anchors and strong hooks linked to chains. All the enemy ships move to attack it, and they try in every way to stop it and to sink it, some with books and writings or inflammable materials, and wit of which they are full, others with firearms, with rifles, and with rams. The battle rages ever more relentlessly. The enemy prows thrust violently, but their efforts and impact prove useless. They make attempts in vain and waste all their labor and ammunition. The big ship goes safely and smoothly on its way. Sometimes it happens that, struck by formidable blows, it gets large, deep gaps in its sides. But no sooner is the harm done that a gentle breeze blows from the two columns and the cracks close up and the gaps are stopped immediately. Meanwhile, the guns of the assailants are blown up. The rifles and other arms and prows are broken. Many ships are shattered and sink into the sea. Then, the frenzied enemies strive to fight hand to hand, with fists, with blows, with blasphemy, and with curses. Suddenly the Pope falls gravely wounded. Immediately those who are with him run to help him, and they lift him up. A second time the Pope is struck. He falls again and dies. A shout of victory and joy rings out amongst the enemies. From their ships an unspeakable mockery arises. But hardly is the pontiff dead than another takes his place. The pilots, having met together, have elected the Pope so promptly that the news of the death of the Pope coincides with the news of the election of the successor. The adversaries begin to lose courage. 
The new pope, putting the enemy to rout and overcoming every obstacle, guides the ship right up to the two columns and comes to rest between them. He makes it fast with a light chain that hangs from the bow to an anchor of the column on which stands the host, and with another light chain which hangs from the stern, he fastens it at the opposite end to another anchor, hanging from the column on which stands the Immaculate Virgin. At this point a great convulsion takes place. All the ships that until then had fought against the Pope's ships are scattered. They flee away, collide and break to pieces one against another. Some sink and try to sink others. Several small ships that had fought gallantly for the Pope race to be the first to bind themselves to those two columns. Many other ships, having retreated through fear of the battle, cautiously watch from far away. The wrecks of the broken ships have been scattered in the whirlpools of the sea. They in their turn sail in good earnest to those two columns, and having reached them, they make themselves fast to the hooks hanging down from them, and their way they remain safe, together with the principal ship, on which is the Pope. Over the sea there reigns a great calm. Thus we see the church seen as a ship caught in a storm, besieged by evil men from all sides. They buffet the ship with propaganda and actual weaponry, and nearly seize control using schemes and evil teaching. But just when they think they've won, just when things seem the darkest, the Pope is slain, and a new one rises to take his place. And he guides the church out of these dark days by leading her to the only sanctuary that truly exists for the church. He anchors the church in the bosom of the actual Catholic faith, symbolized here in the vision of the Eucharist and of Our Lady. To be clear, the enemies of the church that attack her have tried to take her over and to drive the real church underground, are the minions of Satan. St. Louis de Montfort has a very clear teaching on what the role of Mary will be in this final battle. Take hope in that message, and if you haven't done so yet, use St. Louis de Montfort's consecration to Jesus through Mary as outlined in his book, True Devotion to Mary. Now, St. Louis de Montfort on the role of Our Lady in the crisis in the church. Montfort explains that in the days leading to the Antichrist, a powerful group will emerge from among the clergy, which, through their devotion to Mary, will be granted special powers to fight Satan. But what they will be like, these servants, these slaves, these children of Mary, they will be ministers of the Lord, who, like a flaming fire, will enkindle everywhere the fires of divine love. They will become, in Mary's powerful hands, like sharp arrows, with which she will transfix her enemies. They will be true apostles of the latter times, to whom the Lord of hosts will give eloquence and strength to work wonders, and carry off glorious spoils from his enemies. They will be true disciples of Jesus Christ, imitating his poverty, his humility, his contempt of the world, and his love. They will point out the narrow way to God in pure truth according to the Holy Gospel, and not according to the maxims of the world. It is through these men that God will cause there to be a major conversion to the faith. Such are the great men who are to come. By the will of God, Mary is to prepare them to extend his rule over the impious and unbelievers. But when and how will this come about? Only God knows. In these latter times, Mary must shine forth more than ever in mercy, power, and grace. In mercy, to bring back and welcome lovingly the poor sinners and wanderers who are to be converted and returned to the Catholic Church. At the same time, he believes that the latter days will be marked by steadily increasing periods of persecutions of Christians that not, will not end until the time of the Antichrist and he explains Genesis 3.15 in light of these persecutions. It is chiefly in reference to these last wicked persecutions of the devil, daily increasing until the advent of the reign of Antichrist, that we should understand that first and well-known prophecy and curse of God uttered against the serpent in the Garden of Paradise. It is opportune to explain it here for the glory of the Blessed Virgin, the salvation of her children, and the confusion of the devil. I will place enmities between you and the woman, between your race and her race. She will crush your head, and you will lie in wait for her heel. See Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. The key, he reveals, will be the true recognition and appreciation of the distinction between the power of the intercessions of the saints and that of Mary. Satan fears her not only more than angels and men, but in a certain sense more than God himself. This does not mean that the anger, hatred, and power of God are not infinitely greater than that of the, the, than the Blessed Virgin's, since her attributes are limited. It simply means that Satan, being so proud, suffers infinitely more in being vanquished and punished by a lowly and humble servant of God. God has given Mary such great power over the evil spirits that, as they have often been forced unwillingly to admit through the lips of possessed persons, they fear one of her pleadings for a soul more than the prayers of all the saints, and one of her threats more than all their other torments. Thus we see what the triumph of the Immaculate Heart may look like. 
True devotion to Our Lady will play a critical role in resolving the situation in both the church and the world as we see it today. Will things get worse? Most likely. That is our lot as faithful Catholics. To suffer while the world loses its mind and watch as men who should know better in the church embrace the madness of the world. That is our lot. But it is our duty to resist by devoting ourselves to Christ and his church. And St. Louis de Montfort provides a means that has proven efficacious to that end true devotion to Jesus through Mary. It is hard, and the method he outlines is ultimately the one that should be used instead of more modern, easier versions that involve very little prayer, or few, if any, acts of penance. Remember, we do know how this story ends. The era of corruption in the world and the church embracing the world will end in the triumph of the cross. Remember that. Take that message with you into this new liturgical year, and remember to pray your rosary and to increase your prayer life. Do not despair, for these are the times that the greatest of saints are made. Thank you for listening. I'm Anthony Stein. Ave Maria.